Good morning. Today is the 7th of Kislev. Um, is it the 7th or is it the 8th? Why can't I remember? <laughs> it's, the, it's the 7th and the uh, 20th of uh, November. We're going to look at the second reading of Farshat Vayetze. In this reading, Jacob arrives in Haran, or at least on the outskirts, and he does something which, by the way, it, 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 it ties into what we spoke about last week, that Isaac preferred Esau because he was much more uh, with might and he was able to uh, force reality. Jacob does something like Esau. We see that he's learned something. Um, he uh, sees that the shepherds are all waiting around the well and they're not going to shepherd their flocks and it's only the midday. And so he asks them, why are you going? So they say, we have to all gather here around the well, and then together we can move this big stone that covers the well and keeps the water uh, inside. And we can only do it when we're all there together. And then Jacob sees Rachel, Laban's daughter, and seeing her, he's suddenly filled with strength, and he's able to move the stone, this great big stone, all by himself. So there's a lot to be said about exactly what happened there, but this is a, a, a principle that repeats many times that a lot of, many of the times the reason why somebody doesn't have the might needed, the uh, perseverance, the strength needed to change something in reality is simply because he hasn't met it yet. And he's too theoretical. And in this case, when Jacob actually meets Rachel and he's re, she's reality, she's, she's the feminine for him, She's his feminine side. Suddenly he's filled with much more strength than what he thought. Um, in fact, in a certain sense, we always say that Esau was uh, more fitted in a certain sense to be, meaning that the original um, quad, I don't know how to call it, quadri, quadrivium of archetypal souls was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Esau was supposed to be in the place of kingdom. But he lost his place and Rachel took it. So in a certain sense, she's the one who's giving now uh, Jacob the power of Esau. Um, but let's, let's focus on something a little bit different here. When he does enter into Haran, into the city, Jacob learns that uh, Laban, his uncle, has two daughters. Later on, you remember, in the next reading, we're going to find out, actually, it's in, in this reading even, uh, we're going to, to notice that Jacob can't tell the difference between the two. Meaning, somehow, Laban was able to trick him. This happened, this does happen in the next reading, in tomorrow. How was Laban able to trick him? Well, the simple answer is, just as Jacob and Esau were twins, Leah and Rachel were also twins. So they might have been very, very similar. So that would have made uh, Laban's trickery much easier. In any case, what do Rachel and Leah represent? There's always this question of why did Jacob marry more than one wife? In the end, he ends up marrying four. There's always something that troubles people. First of all, we have to remember that before um, the 10th century, it was permitted to even even in, even in Judaism, was permitted to marry more than one woman. Uh, it wasn't recommended. There's whole tractates, a whole tractate called the Avamot in, in the Talmud, that speaks about how, <laughs> how much this is not recommended, why it doesn't work. But so, some people did it. Uh, the, the maximum that was allowed was King David, who had 18 wives. Um, by the way, Solomon, who is said to have a thousand, so we know that most of them were not really his wives. Uh, it says in one place there were 300 wives and 700 concubines, but really he didn't even go very far beyond the 18 that uh, David was allowed, and in any case he was punished for it because he wasn't allowed to go beyond them. But in any case, Jacob has four wives. The way this is seen in the inner dimension of Torah is that all four wives are actually representative of one idea, just one idea, which is divided here, when we look at the Torah from a symbolic point of view, it's divided into four different aspects. 
We'll talk about those four different aspects tomorrow. Today we'll just talk about the first two. Leah and Rachel, when we uh, t treat them as archetypes, they represent what we call supernal wisdom and mundane wisdom, or the supernal realm and the revealed realm, or the concealed realm and the revealed reality. One example of this is thought versus speech. Both thought and speech are predicated on language, but Leia represents the concealed language, the language of the mind, which is not expressed ever to anyone but the person himself. Rachel, on the other hand, she represents speech, which is also predicated on language, but it's revealed language. The whole point of speech is to articulate and to express things to others. So Leia is always related to things that are concealed, Rachel to things that are revealed. When we look at them, we see that that's how they are. Uh, Rachel is the one who is going out, at least now. She's going out, and she's the one that Jacob sees. She's the one that he falls in love with. Re Leah, on the other hand, is at home crying. Crying because uh, the people told her that just as Rebecca had two sons that are twins, Esau and Jacob, so your father had twins, you and your sister, and so it should work that the elder son goes to the elder daughter. So she, Leah, was supposed to marry Esau, and she was crying out about that because she didn't want that to happen. So she's concealed. But this goes a lot, uh, a lot deeper, and I'm not going actually to speak about how we explained it in Wonders this week. I'm going to speak about a way that the Alter Rebbe uh, explains this. And he says that since both of them are the feminine, they represent two aspects of God's presence in the world, the concealed presence and the revealed presence. What does that mean? In general, we talk about God's presence, the Shekhinah, as being, as it were, the feminine uh, aspect of God revealing himself. Meaning he reveals himself also as, as a feminine form. The feminine form is the Shekhinah, the divine presence. What does it mean that the Shekhinah has a concealed aspect to it and a revealed aspect to it? One of the ways that this is explained in Kabbalah and the Alter Rebbe of Chabad, he explains this in length, he has a very long essay on this, and it was developed further over the years, is that when the Jewish people went into exile, it says in the Talmud that the Shekhinah went with them, the Divine Presence went with them. What does that mean? It depends. If the Divine Presence means the concealed aspect, then that would mean that the Torah uh, went with us. If the Divine Presence we're referring to is the revealed aspect of the Divine Presence, then it's talking about our observance of the commandments. So we have these two aspects. <coughs> the thought of the Divine Presence is the Torah. <coughs> Sorry. The revealed aspect of the Divine Presence, the Rachel of it, is the performance of commandments. Now it's a very interesting thing, that from the time of the exile, the statement here is that only the concealed Divine Presence remained in the land of Israel, and what the sages say that the Divine Presence went out into exile with us is referring to the revealed Divine Presence, meaning the power to perform, the power to be committed to the performance of commandments. And so we have this strange situation that once we come back to the land of Israel, it's not so easy to get back the Divine Presence into the land of Israel. Let me explain what this actually means. It means that those who are observant in the land of Israel now, and we see this, this is a very clear uh, analysis of society today, of Jewish society in, in the land of Israel today, those who perform the commandments are those who are still tied to Leah, to the concealed Divine Presence which is still here, the Torah. In other words, you don't see very many people who perform commandments without being inspired by the Torah itself. It's almost non-existent, in fact. 
is actually very strange because usually when you look at the um, culture of a people, most of the people follow the culture without needing to be inspired. Most of the people are just part of the culture. They just do it. And so even though in exile, everybody was part of the culture, all Jews performed all the commandments. There was almost no such thing as a, as a Jew who wasn't observant. As we started coming back to the land of Israel, the revealed aspect of the Divine Presence is still apparently outside the land of Israel. It hasn't come back yet. And so the performance has not come back to the land of Israel. So the people who are performing the commandments, who are observant, are those who are attached, connected to Leah, to the Torah. And that's one of the signs, uh, says the Alter Rebbe, and he, he didn't even know there was no real movement yet to the land of Israel, all that was in his time in the late 1700s. We're talking about uh, a few hundred families that had moved from Europe to the land of Israel. There was always a Jewish presence here, but it wasn't very big. And so 200 families moved a few years before he writes this. But he already tells us, you should know that in the beginning stages of the redemption, as we come back, the divine presence that is in the land and has stayed here since the time of the temple is the Leah aspect, the concealed aspect, the Torah aspect. So the Torah aspect is still here. And indeed, we see that the greatest knowledge of Torah, even during the exile, didn't come from outside the land of Israel. The Jerusalem Talmud, which is considered to be much higher and much greater in depth and breadth and, and especially in wisdom than the Babylonian Talmud was written in the land of Israel, even after the destruction of the temple. It was even written a little bit later. The Medrash, what we call the homiletic interpretations, Medrash Rabbah, Pirkei Bileazar, and so on, all these were written in the land of Israel. The Kabbalah was developed by Rabbi Isaac Luria here, even the earlier Kabbalah, which some people say started in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in southern France, was not really from that. The Zohar is written in the land of Israel. The other, uh, the other Kabbalistic works are written in the land of Israel. Most importantly, Rabbi Isaac Luria and Rabbi Moses Cordovero, the two giants that straddle the ancient Kabbalah and the new Kabbalah, or the more modern Kabbalah, they all lived in the, in the land of Israel. And so you have this, and you have this very interesting thing, that the Torah is still here, the concealed aspect of the Divine Presence is still present here, and we're waiting, as it were, for Rachel to return. And Rachel is sitting on the outskirts. And what does the return of Rachel mean? It means that even a person who is not connected to Torah, who's not being inspired daily, who's not sitting and studying, will, even in the land of Israel, again, this is not common today, will feel the need to naturally perform the commandments. This is such an important topic that Rav Ginsburg dedicates to it more than one book, actually three books, called uh, usually something like Natural Consciousness or, or a Jewish Nature or all kinds of things like that, which discuss what does it mean for Rachel to return? What, what will that mean? And basically, in a nutshell, since we don't have time, what it means is that the performance of the commandments will, done as, will be done as second nature, without needing to actually uh, uh, learn it from the Torah. It's almost like it flows naturally. This is a state in which when a person wakes up in the morning, it's just natural for them. It's not habit even. It's just natural to pray. It's natural to put on phylacteries, tefillin. It's natural to keep Shabbos. It's not some kind of uh, commandment from above. And that actually is discussed in, in great length uh, by the Hasidic masters, and they see it as the herald of the redemption. When we come to a state where it feels natural, in fact, it's such an important thing, this concept, that there's a, there's a melody in Chabad in, 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 that's sung by, by a lot of people, very well known, about why is it that when I eat, it gets eaten naturally. It, it, I, I digest it naturally. When I sleep, it sleeps. 
I, I don't have to tell myself to sleep. It just happens by itself. But why is it that when I learn, it doesn't get learned? Why is it that when I pray, it doesn't get prayed? It doesn't happen naturally. But searching for that second nature is searching for that return of the revealed divine presence to the land of Israel. The moment that it returns to the land of Israel, it will spread out over the entire world. Thanks for joining.